from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hi, um, I'm Hannah Lynch and I work at the Library of Congress. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today to introduce one of my favorite authors, Lois McMaster Bujold. Um, it's a particular pleasure that the friends who originally introduced me to her work are here in the audience. Um, since her first three novels were published in 1986, Lois has won um, pretty much every award for writing the community can bestow. Um, five Hugo Awards, three Nebula Awards, three Locus Awards, and numerous other recognitions from science fiction conventions, state library organizations, international li literary groups, everyone. Her work doesn't just enthrall because of the richness of the storytelling. She has a wonderful talent for addressing important questions while at the same time making us care deeply about her characters. Each new book is like a reunion with a group of dear friends. We get a little glimpse into what's happened in their lives since we last saw them, then we head off for new and exciting adventures. Her last novel in the Vorkosigan series, Cryoburn, was the latest in a long line of bestsellers, and we're eagerly awaiting the upcoming entry in the so saga, Captain Vorpatrel's Alliance. Please join me in welcoming Lois McMaster Bujol. Okay, wow, this is a great audience here. Uh, I should start actually by asking you all a question and do a little pre-survey to find out what kind of listening I'm talking into. How many here have read at least one of my books before? Okay, most of them. How many have not read any? New, new. Yes, yes, we want to see you. This is what we come out here for, for the new readers. For the uh, very newest readers, if you get curious, over in the Barnes & Noble tent, they have my latest hardcover, Cryoburn which has bound in the back a CD with 10 of my backlist books in it as e-books. So that's a bargain today uh, over at the Barnes & Noble tent for, for those new, uh, new readers, which we are so glad to see. It's a gorgeous day for this. It's just fabulous. So anyway, I've got basically three parts for this speech. I have a little set speech, uh, probably about 20 minutes, and then I can do a short reading from Captain Vorpatrel's Alliance, which is the new book coming up in November. Not quite in time for this. Uh, and then will the rest will be Q&A, uh, so think about your cues. Uh, and try to keep the questions a little bit general because otherwise it tends to end up like listening to two people talk at a family reunion about a relative you've never met. You know? <laughs> and what's Miles doing now? Yeah, everybody wants to know what their friends are up to. But, uh, but we'll take those questions as they come. At any rate, uh, back in June uh, when the... Uh, promotion for Captain Vor Petrol's Alliance was starting to gear up, I was invited to be part of a panel discussion of speculative fiction at the American Library Association's annual convention, which is a huge deal for a writer. 22,000 librarians meet to discuss their work with each other. I see librarians in the audience cheering, uh, many of whom are also tasked to order books for their communities. It's rather a cross between a large academic conference and a large trade show. It has three main parts, a huge exhibitors area, where everyone who has anything they think they might possibly sell to libraries out for display, not just books, although there were plenty of publishers, both large and small, but everything from library furniture to computers and data systems to bookmobiles. There are about a thousand private conferences and committee meetings, off in various corners, chewing on special problems, including such things as the Newberry Award Committee, which is the important award for children's books, or people wrestling with technical issues having to do with the move to electronic information transfers of every type, something that American libraries have been uh, in the forefront of for decades. And finally, more entertaining programming with the writers or artists or editors speaking to their allies, the librarians. That was my little piece of this giant thing. Anyway, I was informed our panel was to be not science fiction convention style, where a topic is kicked around free form among the panelists under the direction, or sometimes lack of it, of a moderator, uh, but academic style, where each speaker has a certain number of minutes, 10 to 15 in this case, to address the topic, followed by a much shorter question and answer session than the usual flowing discussion that rambles all over the room. 
and it must be admitted often far from the original topic. Our topic, at least to the panel, the title that they gave us in advance was From Interstellar Adventures to Epic Fantasy, The Influence of Science Fiction and Fantasy on the World Today. My first reaction on being confronted with this was to think, isn't that a trifle broad for 10 minutes? <laughs> and indeed, both, my, both of my fellow panelists proceeded to mostly ignore the hook and go on to offer their usual well-practiced self-presentation speeches. Um, but you know, I'm a girl, I read the directions. <laughs> I actually attempted to address the topic, impossible as it seemed. So in order to wedge it open, I bethought of another speculative fiction genre technique, also found in the sciences, by the way. Turn the question around. What would our world look like today if none of the genres of speculative fiction had ever been invented? What if is itself considered one of the fundamental questions of our genre asks, so this seemed nicely recursive. A real analysis would probably take a couple of PhDs worth of historical research. This is what I came up with on the fly. It starts with a great book burning. To begin at what is usually considered the beginning, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, um, and the dozens of critiques, parodies, and uh, cultural icons it has spawned in the next two centuries, uh, that would not exist. Um, that, was, that was the beginning, so wipe that one out. No Jules Verne, no From the Earth to the Moon, or 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, no submarine named the Nautilus, and possibly no second submarine named the Nautilus either, of which more in a moment. No H.G. Wells, no War of the Worlds, or Visions of Interplanetary Invasion. No The Island of Dr. Moreau, looking both back to the Greek legend of Circe and forward to the moral dilemmas of modern genetics. No Orson Welles broadcast adaptation of the former tale to famously spark the first mass media-fueled panic either. Possibly, radio might not have been invented yet. No E.E. E. Doc Smith with his visions of interstellar and galactic travel, following almost as soon as the nature of galaxies was discovered. His books inventing that trope date back to before World War I. No Edgar Rice Burroughs, no Aldous Huxley, no Brave New World, no 1984, though Orwell's political views might well have found another allegorical form through which to present themselves. No Heinlein, Clark, or Asimov, that's about where I came in. No Ray Bradbury, no Martian Chronicles, no Fahrenheit 451. No Hugo Gernsback, none of the great flowering of pulp magazine fiction of the 20s, 30s, 40s, and outward. No Metropolis, no Buck Rogers, no Star Wars, no Star Trek. Um, the Universal Credit Card, I'm not sure about. You know, I first read about that back in the 1950s. Um, and when the internet was not really thought of yet. Uh, it's still a marvel, it seemed a marvel then, but we've just stopped realizing it. There's a lot we, a lot we get used to very quickly here. The fantasy side does not escape this cultural carpet bombing, this mass deforestation either. No Edgar Allan Poe, no modern Gothic, no horror, and a huge bite taken out of the development of the mystery genre. A big bite also out of the works of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle as well. No, The Lost World, now there's a trope. With no William Morris and Lord Dunsany to invent the notion of fantasy sub-creations in novel form for adults, no Inklings, no C.S. Lewis, no J.R.R. Tolkien, no Middle Earth, no Wizard in Oz. The very language of our culture, all our metaphors, grossly impoverished. A great many writers, including Lois McMaster Bujold, would have had to find another genre in which to write. That said, if the form of speculative fiction had never been developed, though it's very hard to see how this two centuries long conversation could have been prevented, I don't think that we would all now be stuck in the scientific and technological world of 1820. A great deal of science, technology, and invention has been brought forth by men and women who never once thought of fictionalizing their work or of reading fiction about it. The future would have found some other crack or channel pushing through like the tide against a dike. The invention of invention predates both Tom Swift and Tom Edison. 
If Arthur C. Clarke had not come up with the idea of the communication satellite, someone else would have, maybe, sometime, eventually, somewhere. But the first nuclear submarine to pass under the Arctic ice sheet might have had another name, and almost certainly a later year for its venture. Waldos would not be called Waldos, but they might still exist. Those were a Robert Heinlein idea, by the way. The world has always been changing just below the threshold of generational perception. But the past 200 years have seen not only a lengthening of generations, but an increase in the rate of change. Change has become a discernible norm, expected instead of surprising. That itself is a change in ways that go beyond the routine grumbling of the older generations about the younger ones that go back to Roman and Greek and Han and Egyptian times and likely earlier if only the documentation could just be found. But I recently attended a science fiction convention in Huntsville, Rocket City, Alabama, a town which hosts, among other things, a major NASA installation. This con had, as is common for science fiction conventions, an excellent turnout of local scientist science fiction fans helping to give programs and panels, not just from NASA with its famous facilities there, but in genetics and neurobiology and engineering as well. This stuff works to engage lively minds. One of the astronauts famously mentioned uh, Star Trek's Uhura as a role model who blasted open doors to a previously unimagined future for her. I have myself received letters from young student readers, a number of them, telling me they were inspired to try engineering as a career by my own novel, Falling Free. No, not all scientists are inspired by science fiction, but a large number are, especially now that it permeates the entire culture. And the habits of thinking outside the box was modeled for me by my own science fiction reading, Scientist Engineer Father, a Caltech grad and holder of 17 patents, who in late life was praised by his colleagues for his vision. Where did he get it, they wondered. Or as my military engineer colonel friend at the Huntsville Con proudly described his superior portioning out the workload among his brother officers. And that's Bart. He's the one we give all the weird problems to. <laughs> so what's happening here? I have described a genre as any group of works in close conversation with one another. I say works, not just books, because there are genres in painting and architecture and dance and all the other arts as well. And conversation stimulates. All of the attendees at the library conference, or at any other trade show, or academic or medical or scientific conference, or hobby convention, which science fiction conventions are, come together in order to have just such a conversation in the genre and art of making whatever it is they make from knitted shawls, to model railroads, to space exploration, to brain surgery. People meet to share, multiply, and trigger ideas in each other. This sort of concentrated conversation acts as a catalyst for change, which is why these sorts of parties are so worthwhile. And grand fun, but as my friend the accountant remarks, the IRS doesn't say you can't enjoy your work. Chemical reactions still proceed in the absence of a catalyst, but painfully slowly. The catalyst, although not taking direct part in the reactions, sets up a feedback loop to speed them up, sometimes explosively. I think that the science fiction genre conversation has indeed been a catalyst for a lot of real science and technology in the last 200 years, results that we enjoy or struggle with and curse today. And although critical pundits have been announcing the death of my genre ever since I first strolled in as a reader 53 years ago, this is not a new part of the conversation, friends, I don't think this conversation is stopping anytime soon. If anything, if it moves to new platforms, as it moves to new platforms, it seems to be speeding up. Thus, science fiction's apologia, our self-justification. Pretty good. But, you know, one only needs to justify oneself to a hostile interrogator. I have become, over the years, increasingly suspicious of all demands that any art justify itself by some utilitarian, or worse, political criteria. Architecture accepted, perhaps. 
But the notion that books should be judged or judged wanting by how well they fulfill or don't this or that political agenda on the critic's part rather than how well they channel the passionate self-expression of the writer's part can become a little toxic. I used to say that at its worst, it leads to the reduction of art to propaganda. Upon reflection, I think that's merely the worst. The real worst comes if the writers should internalize these constricted values to the destruction of their vision while it's still inside their own secret heads, a kind of literary contraception. The late Ray Bradbury told this story many times, how as a nine-year-old, he was persuaded by his critical classmates to tear up all his laboriously collected and deeply beloved Buck Rogers comic strips. Those were in the days, decades before the collections of comics into more permanent books was ever thought of. Uh, mind you, not that Bradbury the boy could have afforded such a thing had it existed. And how a month later, he reawoke to himself and realized how much these people were not actually his friends to so part him from this wellspring of joy in his life. So I'd also like to bring this meditation down from the cultural to the personal about what books and fiction generally, not only science fiction and fantasy, can do for individual people in their own skins. This one, and I suspect most writers get some variant of these, springs from these letters that start something like, actually exactly like, Dear Ms. Bujold, I would like to thank you for the great joy your books gave my husband during the last six months of his struggle with leukemia. Because books are read not just in colleges, but also in hospices. Also hospital beds and waiting rooms, in airports and airplanes, in junior high schools, in long dark nights of the soul in a thousand forms, and in many other places where people's lives are unavoidably constrained. I once read an interview with a forensic pathologist in Columbus, Ohio, who remarked that he had never entered a bad crime scene, the sort with blood on the walls, in any house where there were a lot of books. These disasters were all book-free spaces, which upon reflection made all kinds of sense to me. If there is no escape of any kind, emotional pressures have no release but to build up and up until they explode. Fiction especially, gives our minds and souls another place to be, a personal time out, even if we cannot evade our captivity in any other way. In fact, many such captivities are honorable, such as my 50-something woman friend who lived in her parents' basement with a large book collection, sounds like a nerd, because she'd given up her day job to return home and give hourly care to her blind, diabetic, crippled mother, or any woman in thrall to her young children. Blessed are the caregivers, for they shall at least have something to read. <laughs> I'm sure I'm not the only person who selects their fiction diet by emotional mood. Fiction as self-medication doesn't get a good rap from the critics, probably because it does nothing to enhance would-be perceived status. But I think it is a profoundly more important real-world effect than it's given credit for. Reading the fiction that feeds our hearts can help us manage pain, stay civilized, sometimes sane. At the end of Shakespeare's Love's Labor's Lost, the wit Barone laments the task he has been assigned. To move wild laughter in the throat of death? It cannot be. It is impossible. Mirth cannot move a soul in agony. Well, yes it can. It may be the only thing that can. Well, befall what befall, I'll just a 12 month in a hospital is not so bad a gig for any writer. That is the end of my set speech. Uh, and that's enough to chew on for a while. So we have, uh, we have two options. We can have more time for Q&A, or we can have a short reading and then the Q&A. Uh, a short reading, yeah, this would be good. This is, for those of you who have read the e-arc of Captain Vorpatrol's Alliance or seen the free online chapters, you will have heard this bit, but it's fairly short. And for everyone else, it will be new and a sort of a taste of, okay, what, what does this writer Bujold actually do when she's <clears throat> doing her actual work? Um, this is a short scene out of uh, a new book. Um, 
with, uh, which, uh, with a long-standing series character, which I hope to heck will work equally well for new readers. Um, and uh, he, is, uh, he is a young officer um, in a militaristic society, a planet about a thousand years in the future, descended from Earth, and they are having, uh, having their own historical struggles. Uh, but Ivan's, Ivan's problem in this book are more personal. So here is Ivan coming to work. Despite everything, Ivan managed to arrive at Komar Downside HQ right on time this morning, half an hour before his boss was due. Though more often than not, the planes managed to bollocks that schedule by arriving early. Ivan started the coffee, sat at his secured comm console, grimaced, and fired it up to find out what all had arrived in the Admiral's inbox since last shift. Ivan had developed a personal metaphor for this first task after the coffee of the day. It was like opening one's door to find that an overnight delivery service had left a large pile of boxes on one's porch, all marked miscellaneous. In reality, they were all marked urgent, but if everything was urgent, in Ivan's view, they might as well all be labeled miscellaneous. Each box contained one of the following. Live, venomous, agitated snakes on the verge of escape. Quiescent, venomous snakes. Non-venomous garden snakes. Dead snakes, or things that looked like snakes but weren't, such as large, sluggish worms. It was Ivan's morning duty to open each box, identify the species, vigor, mood, and fang count of the writhing things inside, and sort them by genuine urgency. The venomous, agitated snakes went straight to De Plains. The garden snakes were arranged in an orderly manner for his later attention. The dead snakes and the sluggish worms were returned to their senders with a variety of canned notes attached with the heading from the office of Admiral De Plains, ranging, ranging from patiently, uh, patiently explanatory to brief and bitter depending on how long it seemed to be taking the sender in question to learn to deal with his own damned wildlife. <laughs> Ivan had a menu of De Plain's notes, and it was his responsibility, and occasionally pleasure, because every job should have a few perks, to match the note to the recipient. As he had both expected and feared, and urgent, of course, note from Impsek Kumar with his full police interview of yesterday attached, was nestled among this morning's boxes and the supply of venomous, agitated snakes in today's delivery, delivery was disappointingly low. After a brief struggle with his conscience, Ivan set the note in the garden snakes file, although he did put it at the very bottom of the list. Displains was possibly the sanest boss Ivan had ever worked for, and the least given to dramatics, and Ivan wished to preserve those qualities for as long as he could, forever by preference. So every once in a while, Ivan let something trivial but amusing filter through to the Admiral, just to keep up his morale. And today seemed a good day to stick in a couple of those as well. Ivan was still looking for a few more things he could legitimately enter when Displains blew in, collected his coffee, and murmured, Ophidian census today, Ivan? All garden variety, sir. Wonderful. Displains took a revivifying sip of fresh brood. Ivan wished he could remember which famous officer had once said, the Imperial Service could win a war without coffee, but would prefer not to have to. Whatever came of your interview with the Dome Cops yesterday? I put the Imsec note in file three, sir. File three was the official designation of the Garden Snakes crate, because, after all, sometimes displays did suffer a substitute aid if Ivan was on leave or out ill or requisitioned for other less routine duties, and some shorthands took too long to explain. I expect you will want to look at it eventually. Ivan made his tone very unpressing. Righto. Meeting with Commodore Blanc and staff in 30 minutes, Ivan reminded him. I have the agenda ready. Very well, snakes away. Ivan hit the said pad. On your desk now. Displains raised his coffee cup in salute and passed into, the, into his inner office. And uh, somewhere. Ivan, he would never, Ivan reflected, ever want to be promoted to admiral to be greeted the first thing every working day by a desk populated entirely by live hissing snakes. Perhaps he could resign his commission if such a threat ever became imminent. Assuming he made it to that stately age without being court-martialed, 
a consummation depending closely in turn on his doubtful ability to avoid relatives associated with Impsec bearing gift pythons, gift pythons with snazzy reticulated blue and gold skins this time, it seemed. He bent to his comm console and returned a crisp note to Impsec Kamar. From the office of Admiral Displanes, urgent memo received and the date stamp, hold pending review. So, it's a little glimpse of Ivan at work. <laughs> Ivan's an interesting character, one of those that started sort of out of the prop box and then just kept going, as so many of mine have. You know, they, they arrive to fill a role you know, in, in one story and then keep growing you know, between books and then come back with much more to say next time around. So I think we can move on to question and answer. Uh, however, this is organized. I think you have an organization. I think what they have is have people come up to the microphone um, one at a time and speak their questions into it so everyone can hear. And then uh, this part of the program will go wherever, wherever you take it. I will try to keep my questions short enough not to burn out all our time. Oh, we got lots of time left. So go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I've enjoyed your books for a long time. Uh, introduced by friends in college, of course. Now I teach at Marymount University, just across the river in Arlington. And I'm wondering, as a folklorist and medievalist myself, my understanding is you've had some education in the discipline of folklore. Am I right in remembering uh, that? No, not especially. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm like most writers, I've been very eclectic, a very mm -hmm. broad and shallow kind of education mm -hmm. that it isn't really, you know, really good for anything but being a writer. Um, but I, you know, of course, read widely. Well, then let me broaden my question, if I may. Yeah. Um, just that what I've always been impressed with is your word, world building and the amount of cultural detail that you develop and the real cultural and source, social forces at work. And I was wondering if you would could well, comment a little bit more on that. Yeah, it's uh, once again, it's you know, it's part of. I'm probably mostly a character-centered writer, mm -hmm. but part of doing right by my characters is to give them a proper milieu to work in, uh, to move in, uh, it should, it should, and ideas come out of the setting. Actually, setting, idea, character, plot. Um, it doesn't really matter what order you start in, as long as they're all there when you finish. And once the book is set up and running, each of these feeds ideas into the other. So the, the setting makes the characters grow, and the plot makes the characters grow, and the characters demand certain kinds of settings to happen next, so that they have a stage to step on. Okay. So it's it's a uh, it's a very feedback loop sort of process, and it doesn't have a set uh, mode that I use. Uh, but yeah, you know, certainly you know you. In order to write anything, they say write what you know. It means you need to stuff your head with everything you can find out. Uh, so obviously the, the worlds I build depend on what I've learned, what I've read, what I've seen, what I've experienced, uh, you know, life experiences as well as things out of books. I, I particularly like the life experiences because I know that they are mine um, and won't be duplicated by eight other writers next season. <laughs> All of a sudden, oh, everybody's writing Spain. Um, so. Uh, so it's, it's just a question of being alert to the world and, and taking in as much as you can. Uh, Great, thank uh, you. Academic doesn't hurt, but it's not where it comes from. <laughs> Should we switch back and forth here? Yeah. Hi, my name is Pam Puffman. I'm an avid fan. One of my favorite w books is the prequel, Falling Free. And I loved how you tied it in with diplomatic immunity and we got to see where the quaddies have mm. gone. But I was wondering, are you ever going to do a sequel to Falling Free? Uh, that's probably an idea that has fallen by the wayside. At the time I wrote it, I thought it ought to be, it ought to be a trilogy, you know, the, the escape from uh, Pharaoh and, you know, 40 years in the wilderness and, you know, arrival in Canaan kind of thing. But I didn't really want to write 40 years in the wilderness and other books came along and that idea kind of drifted away. So uh, using uh, Quadi Space as a setting for diplomatic immunity kind of took the place of those, you know, other books I would have written. Now they're, now they're prequels, I know how they come out, and you know, the idea is not as interesting to follow up. What interests me about the Quadis and a great many of the other genetic engineered uh, people in my science fiction future history is that they are one example of speciation of human beings. You know, we've, uh, my idea of the, uh, the future of this particular uh, science fiction world is not that we meet aliens, but that we genetically engineer ourselves, and 10,000 years down the timeline, the aliens will all be us. You know, we will be 
So it's like, how many things can I think of that will fit this model? And the Quadis were one. Thank you. Hi, I'm Irene Posey. I'm also an avid fan and uh, a uh, up and coming writer myself. I'm currently in the stage of getting rejection slips. So, Congratulations. Uh, so I have a technical question. As an established author, how do you, uh, how do you, or how did you go through the process of having an idea or having a finished work even, and then getting it uh, out? Getting it out there. Yeah, yeah, getting it out there. Yeah. Well, my experience all dates back to the mid 1980s, so it's kind of out of out of date for a lot of the younger writers coming up. Uh, but basically, you know, Heim Heinlein's rule: write it, finish it, send it out. Uh, it pretty much you know, still applies. Uh, where you send it to is different today. Uh, back back in the 80s, they were like, you know, you had a certain number of magazines you could send short stuff to, books. Um, there is no particular advantage of short stories over long work for breaking into the market. Um, the, uh, the odds are about the same either way. Uh, <laughs> so write what I think you're best at is the, the good way to go. If, if novels are what come to you, then the novel is you know, what you should do. You, know, you don't necessarily have to do a, uh, an apprenticeship of writing short stories before you do novels, uh, for, if you're a natural novelist. Now, if you're a natural short story writer, it's the other way around. You don't have to do a novel. You know? um, so that's, that's two. Uh, and beyond that, it's you know, it's still it wasn't easy then, and it's not any easier now. So good yeah, luck. So I'm starting to learn. Thank you. <laughs> okay, over here. Uh, hello. Have you considered writing a book set in Beta Colony or Sergir? Beta Colony or Sergir? Sergir's got possibilities. Beta Colony is is a little too tame. Um, yeah, we could do <laughs> we could do things. It's like going to the suburbs and trying to write a story. It would all be very mundane. Um, Sergier is a bit of a frontier. It's got it's got possibilities. It's a it's a question of the series structure. I built this. I flung myself into this series in the early '80s when I started writing, um, and uh, took it where it went. Me. It never had an overarching plan, but it seems to have acquired a structure and an ending. And I keep trying to end it, and people keep wanting more. And so I give them another ending. <laughs> it's like we do three endings in, since the turn of the millennium, and none of them have stuck. So, uh, so I don't know. Uh, another option might be to do some short work, which I haven't done for a while, and sort of fill in little bits. But yeah, Sir Gareth's got possibilities, although you know, not not war stories. I'm tired of war stories. <laughs> Back over here. Uh, at the uh, WorldCon in 2007, and I think DragonCon in 2008, you know, people were going, "Well, what about Ivan?" And you seemed resistant to uh, writing Ivan's story. So what happened? <laughs> I got an idea that I liked. <laughs> this is the thing. I've, I've resisted you know, blandishments from everything, everybody up to and including paying publishers about what I ought to write next. Um, and uh, it, it has, the idea has to speak to me. And there's this kind of a visceral feel. It's almost in, you know, a density in the solar plexus that tells me, you know, this is an idea I want to think about for a year because I've got to spend a lot more time on this book than you guys do. So it really has to speak to me. Um, so uh, it, it just, you know, I thought, ah, wait, this is what I can do to Ivan. That will be fun. And then the book happened. Yeah. But, you know, the day before that idea would have, yeah, I would have been blank on it. So. Okay. David Sheckler, uh, love your books, of course. Two questions. First, uh, in your basic speech, you were talking about uh, science fiction sort of predicting technological advance. To me, that's sort of coincidental. The real issue is how do human beings deal with the advancing technology, and that's what science fiction tells me. Mm -hmm. And the second question is, uh, appears to be a new generation of war on the on the floor. Are there going to be any stories about them? Uh, let's see. The, we've got coming up Captain Verpetro's Alliance. Uh -huh. Yeah, and there's nothing on the uh, nothing in the pipeline after that right now. Oh, oh, okay. oh. So the pipeline, is, <laughs> pipeline is currently empty. Sorry. <laughs> Neat ideas, huh? <laughs> yeah, some, something will come to me. Okay. First, I'd just like to say thank you to so many other people here. Your books have had a real impact on my life, and I really appreciate uh, your work. Um, I also wanted to make a quick comment just that came up in my mind as you were speaking. Uh, you mentioned the emotional uh, impact of books, and I wonder if the world would be a little different if psychiatrists spent a little more time <laughs> prescribing books instead of psychoactive drugs yeah. at some time. Depends, depends on whether their patient is a reader or not. Yeah. You know? so some uh, people don't. You know, so. 
but the question I wanted to ask about was um, you've built one of the most uh, incredibly detailed and internally consistent theologies in the Chalion series that I've ever seen. And I was just interested about how you sort of developed that. Where, you know, where did that idea come from? It's an impossible oh, okay. question to ask that a writer. One, but. That one kind of came from everywhere. The plot of the Chalion books I ripped off wholesale from 15th century Spanish court history. <laughs> But the theology is my own invention, and it kind of it came up sort of biologically as much as anything. And it came in my own reading of uh, you know, genuine mystics and people talking about their religions, uh, and which are a fascinating subject. Um, it's mystics of all these different religions all seem to be sort of focusing into the same place somehow. You know, it's, whether it's the 60 cycle hum of their biology or whether they're onto something, I don't know. Uh, but I thought that was fascinating. And I uh, wanted to uh, do some ornery things with theology. Uh, the, uh, the gods of Chalian are, are not like most of what we you know, think of in terms of gods and, and the constructions that humans have made you know, to date. Uh, so that was, that was interesting to sort of pull it apart and turn it upside down and, and see what would happen. And I wanted something, I wanted a fantasy novel that would take religion seriously, both as a social um, activity of humans you know, by which they manage to help each other and actually do constructive things, not just fling fireballs, um, and also uh, take mysticism seriously. So that's kind of it. It grew as, a, as, as the book, uh, as I wrote the book, as these things do. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Just want to say thanks for coming. Thanks for all the years of enjoyment reading your works. Uh, I did have a question about some of the dialogue. I think my friends and I have always enjoyed the uh, the wit and the insight that's involved in the dialogue in the Verkosigan series. Mm -hmm. um, and while we've got some Milesian inspiration sometimes, we've never kept up with the volume and speed. So just wondering, how do you write that dialogue? Does it just naturally flow when you're writing it, or do, is it more? Uh -huh. Is it a longer process? It is, uh, the advantage of the writer over the reader is I can take as much time as I want. <laughs> so I script my dialogue. Okay. As a matter of fact, when I'm working out a scene, uh, which I do by outline, you know, sort of one at a time, uh, mm -hmm. like beads on a string, uh, dialogue is something that I actually have to have pretty much all blocked out before I sit down to you know, type the scene into my word processor. Because if you just put two characters in a room and they'll start talking about anything and it may not be to the point and it may not be what you need. So I pre-plan and pre-script my dialogue. Um, I call it choreography, oddly enough, rather than script most of the time. It feels like a dance. So it's like, it does not happen by chance when we work on that one. Hi, my name is Lisa Scott. I'm a giant fan of the Chalian books and the Sharing Knife, and I'm wondering if you have any more plans for fantasy kicking around? Uh, not, as I say, the pipeline is empty right now. Uh, none of, neither of those two are blocked off. You know, the Chalian series sort of wants to be a five-book pattern, uh, but I haven't found what I need to say about the other two par missing parts. And the Sharing Knife is, uh, which is a wonderful world that, would be fascinating to get back to has a bazillion possibilities, but also doesn't have that. It hasn't, you know, given me that visceral thing. And then there's a possibility of doing something completely new, which is something no one ever asks for. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm actually a novice fan. Um, I, I'm writing my own book, and a friend of mine gave me your books to illustrate tight third-party narrative. Mm -hmm. And um, so in the last month, I think I've read six. Um, <laughs> it may not be good for you. <laughs> it's not good for my family. They'd like to eat, actually. Um, but what I was wondering is, I've read the Chalian series, and I've read the first two books, and I'm started on the third of The Sharing Knife. And I think you're the first author I've ever read where I can't hear the author's voice. I hear the character's voice overwhelmingly, oh, yeah. and the character's voice is always different. It mm -hmm. seems almost like you write like in character. Yeah, well, for tight third person, what I feel like I'm doing is stepping into the character's skin, you know, into their body, into their viscera, their, their worldview, which spreads out from wherever they stand you know, to the limits of the universe they can see. Every character is the center of his own universe. Uh, and everything is filtered through the, the language they use, the metaphors they use, what they know, what they can compare. It all has to fit the character. Now, when I'm writing a single viewpoint book and somebody comes across me as the first time they've read me, they will often mistake the character's style for the writer's style and make evaluations of me that are actually kind of sideways to what I'm really doing. But they figure it out eventually <laughs> if they read enough. Thank you very so much. So it's, it's a, a matter of really tight 
you know, type viewpoint control. Yeah, first, um, I'd like to thank you for giving us characters that I would love to have as friends and love to hang out with. Um, but my question is, um, I would love to see these books turned into uh, movies if done well, <laughs> and I dread the and fear the thought that they might be turned into movies that would not not be executed yes. properly. But is there anything yeah. in that future? There is nothing uh, nothing currently in the uh, on the horizon with uh, respect to media, and I'm not you know I'm not anxious for it. Uh, back when I was younger and hungrier, it was something I really really wanted because I thought it would bring in some money. Uh, now that I'm a little more comfortably situated, I can I can wait. Uh, so nothing nothing is happening. Um. Uh, when you sort of defend science fiction or fantasy because saying science fiction can do this and it can do this for people, do you ever feel like you're maybe arguing from a weaker position instead of just saying science fiction is literature? Well, you know, what's literature? Uh, you know, uh, it's a lot of the conversation that revolves around uh, this is actually positioning, uh, positioning biosocial status issues as people compete for uh, everything, uh, you know, for attention, for money, for bookshelf space, you know, bookstore space. And so I always want to try to kind of separate out that which is Darwinian struggle for recognition and that which is actually between the writer and the, re the reader, or between the reader and the text. Uh, I think it's, it's useful in these kind of arguments to discern which kind of one you're listening to. And you know, it's up to you to decide which is more important to you, uh, which one you're going to pay more attention to. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's just yeah, it's trying to undercut that that automatic uh, so, uh, status struggle that cuts in whenever people are comparing things because they're people and they do that. Uh, hi, um, I was introduced to your work uh, through a link on a web comic, uh -huh. and I read three of your books online before actually paying for a book. <laughs> Glad and you worked around to that <laughs> last step. <laughs> Uh, I'm wondering uh, just how the movement from the paper medium uh, to a more digital form is affecting your work and uh, uh -huh. very I'm good very glad that. I got started earlier. Let's <laughs> just put, that, put it that way. I've been watching the ebook uh, market with great interest. Um, you know, I've finally gotten my own data because I can't trust anybody else's data. You know? Uh, I've moved uh, some of the books that have rights to that I can move into direct placement ebooks, and I'm watching them very carefully to see how they work. Now, for me, you know, the paper e, you know, I don't read ebooks, but it's fine for people who do. I don't have one of those prejudices about that. Um, and uh, basically, I'm saving all the money I can now just in case the market evaporates out from <laughs> under me and everybody pirates his books, you yeah. uh, know. I have I have no long term uh, plans, but I'm I'm kind of keeping my thumb on the pulse and, and watching it go by. It's interesting changes. Hi, um, I, I'm also a big fan. I guess that's everybody's going to say that because we are right. But um, I wanted to comment about your your discussion earlier in your speech about um, science fiction affecting science or affecting progress. Um, I, I work in cryptography, and um, in my field you can see huge areas where research is driven by people, some science fiction and some people thinking about the world like science fiction writers or science mm -hmm. fiction readers. So, so whole areas of cryptography involving like privacy prever preserving stuff, I think were driven heavily by people thinking about what will the world look like if you have this technology? And then from there, okay, in that world, what would be useful to invent? Mm -hmm. And I just yeah. want to know if, if you've thought about that. And maybe that's a data point. I don't know. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's part of the part of that whole conversation. Uh, in general, uh, we're into overtime. I think we may have to cut people off here. It'll be up to this gentleman uh, to play bad guy. Um, let's see. In general, I think I've lost track of what I was going to say. The uh, <laughs> it's real quick. Give me a cue again. Oh, okay. Um, about the the role of of science fiction in making scientists decide what to work on and oh, giving yes. them tools and, to and think that, about. that feedback loop. Yeah, I have that in my books. I mean, it's part of the world we live in and has been for a long time, um, and it's part of you know a part of examining the world that we live in that science fiction particularly does, and it's unfortunate that. Mainstream fiction doesn't do more. You know, it's it's been kind of weirdly separated out into these once again uh, different status genres. 
Um, but, uh, but I think it's important, I think it's real, and I think it's going to be ongoing. It's not a genie that's going to go back in the box. Over time, he says. Okay. We are, uh, are kind of out of time here. So I guess everyone else, if uh, I will be doing a signing. Um, so. so if you catch me at the signing, you can ask uh, further questions. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.